Hello and welcome to Selection and Evolution, Chapter 17. So we're going to talk about co-evolution, um, specifically with the bee orchid and their pollinator. So co-evolution is the evolution of the adaptations of two species that are the result of the selective pressures that each is exerting on the other. Um, this has occurred in the adaptations of the flowers of many species of plants, um, such as orchids and their very specific pollinators. So the structure of an orchid flower consists of three outer sepals, two petals, and a conspicuously shaped and colored lip, which is a third petal. And you can see that here. So this arrangement encourages cross-pollination and avoids self-pollination. So in bee orchids and fly orchids, the lip both looks and smells like a female of the species of pollinating insect. So male insects attempting to mate with the decoy female will collect the pollen on their backs and deliver it to the stigma of a different flower. Over time, the lip has become more and more like a female insect. So the orchid has a dedicated pollener that is not attracted to the flowers of other species. The male insect receives his award of nectar or wax so long as he is attracted to the decoy female. Sexual reproduction produces genetic variation among individuals in a population. And this genetic variation is caused by independent assortment of chromosomes uh, and therefore alleles during meiosis. Crossing over between chromatids of homologous chrom chromosomes during meiosis, the random mating between organisms within a species, as well as the random fertilization of gametes and mutations. So let's talk about some of those. So independent assortment, crossing over, random mating, and random fertilization reshuffle existing alleles in the population. Offspring will have combinations of alleles which differ from those of their parents and from each other, meaning that even siblings won't look the same or be the same. And this genetic variation produces phenotypic variation. Mutation though, does not reshuffle alleles that are already present. Mutation can produce completely new alleles. And this may happen, for example, by mistake, if um, DNA replication does not go correctly and there is a new base sequence that occurs in that gene. So that's probably how sickle cell, uh, the sickle cell allele of the gene for the production of B globe and polypeptide first arose. So such a change in a gene, which is quite unpredictable, is called a gene mutation. Mama. The new allele is very often recessive, so it frequently does not show up in the population until some generations Mama. after the mutation actually occurred, Mama. when by chance... The new allele is very often recessive, so it frequently does not show up in the population until a few generations after the mutation occurred. So this would happen by chance when two descendants of organisms in which the mutation happened mate and then produce offspring. So mutations that occur in body cells or somatic cells often have no effects at all on the organism. Um, and that's important to remember. Many mutations in the body or somatic cells have no effect on that organism. Um, somatic mutations cannot be passed on to offspring by sexual reproduction. So this would be like if you're in the sun too much or you're you know, laying in a tanning bed too much and you get some mutations in your skin cells that lead to skin cancer, okay, that cancer is not a gametic mutation. It does not get passed on to your children. It's something that it's a somatic mutation that happens only in your body cells and stays there. Um, mutations that are in cells in the ovaries or testes though of an animal um, or in the ovaries or anthers of a plant may be inherited by offspring. So if a cell containing a mutation divides to form gametes, then the gametes may also contain that mutated gene. Um, and if such a gamete is one of the two which fuse to form a zygote, then that mutated gene will also be in the zygote. So then that single cell will divide repeatedly, forming a new organism in which all the cells contain that mutated gene. Genetic variation, whether caused by the reshuffling of alleles during meiosis and asexual reproduction, or I'm sorry, and sexual production, 
or by the introduction of new alleles by mutation, can be passed on by parents to their offspring, giving differences in phenotype. Genetic variation provides that raw material on which natural selection can act. A variation within a population means that some individuals will have features that give them an advantage over other members of that population. And so I always, I always like to use this analogy. Um, if, you, if you were acting um, as a pressure on evolution, if you were natural selection, and I asked you to go into a buffet and pick uh, the best food, the most fit food, and I sent you to a buffet that only had fried chicken, it would be hard for you to pick the most fit food because that's all the same. There's no variation. It's all fried chicken. But if I sent you to a regular buffet with lots of different types of food, lots of variation, then you could pick which one was best. You could pick the one that was most fit. Okay. So variation in a phenotype is also caused by the environment in which the organisms live. So, so much of the phenotype of an animal is dependent on, and its success is dependent on the environment. So for example, some organisms might be larger than others because they had access to better quality food while they were growing up. Variation caused by the environment is not passed on by parents to their offsprings, right? So the ones that are larger because they had a better diet, the diet is coming from the environment. So environmental circumstances helped give variation into the population, but that's not the type of variation that gets passed on to offspring. Phenotypic differences between individuals include qualitative differences, such as blood groups and um, quantitative differences, such as height and mass. So qualitative differences fall into clearly distinguishable categories. Um, these categories have no intermediate or range. So for example, you have one of four possible ABO blood groups. You're either A, B, AB, or O. This is called discontinuous variation. So in contrast, the quantitative differences before individual height or weight may be small and therefore difficult to distinguish. So when the heights of a large number of people are measured, there are no distinguishable height classes. Instead, there is a range of, uh, between, of heights between the two extremes. And this is called continuous variation. So human height is a really good example of continuous variation because height ranges from that of the shortest person in the world, which you see on a tail of that curve, to that of the tallest person, which you see on the other tail of that curve. And any height is possible between these values, right? It's, it, it's, it's not discontinuous. It's not that you're either 5'1 or 6'1. You could be any possible height in between. So it's called continuous variation. For any species, a characteristic that changes gradually over a range of values shows continuous variation. And examples of that would be like height, weight, foot length. It could also be, you know, the size of, of a bird's beak, etc. And on the other hand, discontinuous variation, like human blood groups, is an example um, where there are only four types of blood groups. There are no other possibilities and there are no values in between them. So this is discontinuous. A characteristic of any species with only a limited number of possible values shows continuous variation. So examples would be male or female, right? Gender. You can't, you're, you're male or female or blood group, right? A, B, A, you are either A, B, A, B, or O, okay? The genetic basis of continuous and discontinuous variation, um, both qualitative and quantitative differences in phenotype can be inherited. Both may involve several different genes. However, there are important differences between them. So discontinuous variation, which is the qualitative, has different alleles at a single gene locus, and they will have large effects on the phenotype. And different genes have quite different effects on the phenotype, where in continuous variation, there are different alleles at a single gene locus that have small effects on the phenotype. So these different genes will have 
an often additive effect. Um, and a large number of genes may have a combined effect on a particular phenotypic, uh, phenotypic trait. And these genes are known as polygenic or polygenes. So some examples of discontinuous variation. Um, the inheritance of sickle cell anemia and hemophilia are examples of this type of variation in humans. Also, flower color in snapdragons, stem color of tomato plants, and feather color of chickens are examples from other organisms. So from these examples, you can see that dominance and gene interaction tend to reduce phenotypic variation. When the combined effects of alleles at different loci are equal to the sum of their individual effects, additive genes are those genes that code for the same trait and their effects work together on the phenotype. Additive genes affect the same trait. Okay. So, for example, suppose that the height of an organism is controlled by two unlinked, and if you'll remember, that is on different chromosome genes. Okay, you have capital A, little a, and capital B, little b. Okay, and again, these are genes that contribute to the height of an organism, and they are unlinked. They are genes that are on different chromosomes. The recessive alleles of both genes, which would be little a and little b, each contribute x centimeters to the height of the organism. The dominant alleles, capital A and capital B, each add 2x centimeters to the individual. So since the effect of such genes is additive, the homozygote recessive is therefore potentially 4x uh, uh, centimeters tall, and the homozygote dominant is potentially 8x centimeters tall. The other genotypes will fall between these extremes, which is why, you know, you can have children that are all different heights, even from the same two parents, okay, because there are dominant and recessive genes that are unlinked from different chromosomes uh, that will... Uh, have an additive effect on that individual's height. So interbreeding these um, potentially 6x centimeters tall offspring gives all possible genotypes and phenotypes among the 16 possibilities. So if you're looking here, okay, and these are the parental genotypes, look how many possibilities there are. Okay, and these are all in equal proportions. And again, this is why you would see that these siblings could have a range of height, even though they came from both parents that were the same height. The number of offspring and their potential heights according to their genotypes are summarized here in this histogram. So these results fall approximately on a normal distribution curve. Again, when you see a bell curve, you know that it's continuous variation. Okay. These hypothetical results come from assuming that two unlinked genes, again, from two different chromosomes, each with two alleles, contribute to the height of the organism. So think about what would happen to the quantitative character if more genes, each with an additive effect, were involved. So again, we're only looking at two. What if there were 10? The genes may have more than two alleles. So suppose that all the genes affecting height are on different chromosomes. The number of discrete height classes increases as more genes are involved, right? As you keep adding more and more of these genes and the differences between these classes get less. So even if two or more of the genes are linked on the same chromosome, potentially reducing the number of classes of offspring and increasing the differences between them, crossing over in meiosis will restore that variation. So the differences between different classes will be further smoothed out by environmental effects. Okay, like a polygene, so this is a gene where, whose individual effect on the phenotype is too small to be observed, but which can act together with others to produce observable variation. So the environmental facts are effects on the phenotype. So in the previous example on a phenotype, or in the previous example of continuous variation, um, we were looking at the heights. Okay, and given the heights shown are those that would be expected from the genotype alone. If you were able to take a number of individuals all with the same genotypic contribution to height, it would be most unlikely that their heights would be exactly the same when measured. 
Okay, environmental effects may allow the full genetic potential height to be reached, or it may stunt it in some way. Okay, so one individual might have less food. So even if they have the same genetic potential to reach the same height, it's unlikely because they're from different environments. So one individual might have less food or less nutritious food than another with the same genetic contribution. A plant may be in lower light intensity or in soil with fewer nutrients. Other examples of the effect on environment could include the development of dark tips to ears, nose, paws, and tails in the Himalayan coloring of rabbits um, and of Siamese and Burmese cats. So this coloring is caused by an allele, which allows the formation of that dark pigment only at low temperatures. So the extremities are the coldest parts of the animal. So the, anim the color is produced there. And when an area somewhere else on its body is plucked of fur and kept cold, the new fur growing in this region will be dark. American geneticists, uh, Ralph and Edward East's experiment with maize, um, show the varieties of maize with differently marked, um, which differed markedly in cob length. Both of the, the parental varieties of these corn, um, which were black Mexican and Tom Thumb, were pure bread lines. The cob lengths of the plants used as parents in the first and second generations of offspring resulting from this cross were measured to the nearest centimeter, and the number of cobs, cobs in each length category was counted. So you can see cobs length, number of parents, number of parents, number of F1 offspring. So remember, F1 is um, the cross between two of the offspring from the F0 generations um, moving forward. So both parental uh, varieties were purebred um, and were homozygous at a large number of loci. The first generation were genetically different from the parents, but were genetically the same as one another. The phenotypic variation that you can see within the two parental varieties um, and also within the first generation of offspring show the effect of the environment. The second generation of offspring shows a much wider variation in cob length. Okay, so their cob length in this case is both genetic and environmental. So this is something that's important to, to remember. So when you're getting these types of questions on the exam, they're going to ask you to think about uh, the different possibilities that are affecting the phenotype of any number of individuals. And, um, you know, it's, it's especially in these uh, cob length is going to be continuous variation, right? Because it's not like one cob can only be five centimeters and another cob can be 10. There's a whole range of variation that it can be. So when you're looking at continuous variation, although there are genes that are, that are contributing to it, the environment also uh, has an effect. So the variation of two populations, such as the purebred black Mexican and Tom Thumb maize plants, can be compared using the t-test. So just as genetic variation provides the raw material on which uh, natural selection can act, so in selective breeding, it's important to know how much of the phenotypic variation is genetic and how much of it is environmental in origin. And there's no point in selecting parents for a breeding program on the basis of environmental variation, right? If you're trying to get the longer of the two cobs, you don't want to pick the, the ones that are long only because they had more food in their soil. You want the ones that have genes to contribute to a longer cob size. All organisms have the uh, genetic potential to increase their populations. So looking at this uh, diagram of natural selection, so each species, species shows variation. Okay, so you have two giraffes here. One's a little shorter, one's a little taller the better adapted members of these species are more likely to survive, right? Survival of the fittest. So there's competition um, with each of the species for food, living space, and water. And the one that has the better fitness is going to be uh, have an advantage in getting either food, living space, water, or mate. And so then these survivors will pass on their better genes to their offspring who will also show this beneficial variation. And all organisms have the reproductive potential to increase their population. Okay, rabbits, for example, produce several young in a litter, and each female may produce several litters each year. So if all the young rabbits survive to adulthood and also reproduce, then that rabbit population would increase rapidly. 
And so we see this all the time with rabbits. We saw it in Australia in the 19th century. In 1859, 12 pairs of rabbits from Britain were released in, Vic in Victoria as a source of food for the farmers. The rabbits found conditions, obviously, to their liking. It was a new environment. They didn't have many predators, and there was lots of food. So the rabbits um, feed on that low-growing vegetation, especially grass, and there was a lot of it. There were a few predators to feed on them. Their numbers became so great that they seriously affected the availability of grass for sheep and other wild animals. Um, and such population explosions are rare in normal circumstances in the wild. So although rabbit populations have the potential to increase at such a tremendous rate, usually they don't. So as a population of rabbits increases, various environmental factors come into play to keep down the rabbit's, rabbit's numbers. So these factors may be biotic. They may be caused by other living organisms through predation, um, competition for food between rabbits, or infection by pathogens. Um, or they can be abiotic causes. So these are caused by non-living components such as the environment, like water availability, nutrient levels in the soil, et cetera. So by increasing the number of rabbits, um, increasing the number of rabbits eat an increasing amount of vegetation until food is in short supply. The larger population of rabbits may allow the populations of predators such as foxes, stoats, and weagles to, to increase as well. Overcrowding can occur, increasing the ease with which diseases can spread. So this disease in particular is caused by a virus that is transmitted by fleas. So really, the closer the, the rabbits are, um, the more easily the fleas can pass uh, from one rabbit to the other. Okay, uh, it's a highly infectious and usually fatal viral disease of rabbits, causing swelling of their mucous membranes and inflammation and discharge around their eyes. Environmental factors act to reduce the rate of growth of the rabbit population. Of all the rabbits born, many will die from lack of food or be killed by predators or die from diseases. Only a small portion of young will grow to adulthood and reproduce, so then the population growth will slow. So if the pressure of the environmental factors is sufficiently great, then the population size will decrease as well. So only when the numbers of rabbits have fallen considerably will the numbers be able to grow again. So over a period of time, the population will oscillate about a mean level. The oscillations in learning populations are particularly marked in other species. They are usually less spectacular, though. So lemming populations are famous for their large increases and decreases. There's sort of this volatile um, population increase. In some years, populations become so large that lemmings may emigrate in one group from overcrowded areas. The reason for the oscillating population size is not known for certain, but it's been suggested that food supply or food quality may be the main cause. So as that population rises, food supplies eventually run out, so then the population crashes. Once the population size has decreased, food supplies begin to recover, and the population does as well. So this type of pattern is shown by the populations of many organisms. Uh, the number of young produced is far greater than the number which actually are able to survive for the, uh, into adulthood. Many young die before reaching reproductive age. So what determines which will be the few rabbits to survive and which ones die? So a lot of times it's just luck. However, some rabbits will be born with a better chance of survival than others, outside of luck. And variation within a population of rabbits means that some will have features that may give them an advantage in their struggle for existence. Is coat color. Most rabbits have alleles, which give the normal brown color. A few, however, might be homozygous for the recessive allele, which would give a white coat. Um, these white rabbits will stand out distinctly from the others and are more likely to be picked out by a predator such as a fox. They are less likely to survive than the brown rabbits. So the chances of a white rabbit reproducing and passing on its alleles for its white coat to its offspring are pretty small. So the allele for white coat remains rare in the population. The term fitness is often used to refer to the extent to which organisms are adapted to their environment. So fitness is the capacity of an organism to survive and transmit its genotype to its offspring. So predation by foxes is an example of a selection pressure. Selection pressures increase the chances of some alleles being passed on to the next generation and decreases the chance of others. 
So in the case of alleles of the brown coat, um, they have a selective advantage over the alleles for the white. The alleles for brown will remain the commoner alleles in the population, with the alleles for white remaining rare. The alleles for white coat may even disappear completely. So the effects of such selection pressures on the frequency of alleles in a population is called natural selection. Natural selection raises the frequency of alleles conferring an advantage and reduces the frequency of alleles conferring a disadvantage. So, and that's the thing that it's so important to understand is that the effects of natural selection um, are so dependent on the environment, right? Because the, the alleles that are passing on the brown color or the white color ultimately don't give the rabbit any kind of advantage other than its camouflage, right? But what if they lived in um, the Arctic Circle where it was white most of the time, right? Then the white would be more advantageous. It would help them to get eaten less often where the brown uh, might get them eaten more often. And so in that case, the white would, would be the more fit allele, right? So the allele, the mutation itself, doesn't always have an effect on the survivability of the animal outside of their specific environment. So evolution is a process by which different kinds of living organisms are believed to have developed from earlier forms during the history of the earth. Natural selection keeps things the way they are using stabilizing selection. So a type of natural selection um, in which the status quo is maintained because the organisms are already adapted to their environment is stabilizing selection. So these brown rabbits are the best adapted rabbits to survive predation. So the brown allele remains the most common coat color allele in those rabbit populations. And unless something changes, then natural selection will ensure that this continues to be the case. A directional selection is a type of selection in which the most common varieties of an organism are selected against, thus resulting in a change um, in the features of that population. So directional selection is a mode of natural selection in which an extreme phenotype is favored over others, causing the allele frequency to shift over time uh, in the direction of that phenotype. Okay, And so again, that would be like if there was a sudden change in the environment to where white became the more adaptive allele. Disruptive selection is, so a natural selection that favors the survival of individuals at two different points within the range of variation, resulting in two different phenotypes. And this type of selection can occur when conditions favor both extremes of a population. Uh, this type of selection maintains different phenotypes within the same population. So imagine that we are plunged into a new ice age. The climate becomes much colder, so that snow covers the ground for almost all of the year. Assuming that the rabbits can cope with these conditions, white rabbits now have a selective advantage during seasons which snow lies on the ground, and they therefore are better camouflaged. So rabbits with white fur are more likely to survive and reproduce passing on their alleles. The frequency of the allele for white coat will increase at the expense of the allele for the brown coat. And over many generations, almost all of the rabbits will come to have white coats rather than brown. Most mutations that occur produce features that are harmful. Um, that is, they produce organisms that are less well adapted to their environment uh, than normal organisms. Other mutations may be neutral. Uh, conferring neither an advantage nor a disadvantage on the organisms in which they occur, but occasionally mutations can produce useful features. So imagine that a mutation occurs in the coat color gene of a rabbit producing a new allele, which gives a better camouflage coat than the brown. Rabbits possessing that new allele will have a selective advantage. They will be more likely to survive and reproduce than even the brown rabbits were, so that new allele would become more common in the population. Um, over many generations, most of the rabbits will come to have that new allele, um, and such changes in allele frequency in a population are the basis of evolution. So really, evolution occurs because natural selection um, gives a better chance of survival 
to some over others. And over many generations, populations gradually change to become better adapted to their environments. Examples of such change are the development of antibiotic resistance in bacteria and industrialized melanism in the peppered moth. So in contrast, the role of malaria in the global distribution of sickle cell anemia is an example of how the interaction of two strong selection pressures can maintain two alleles within certain populations. So we're going to talk about each of these more specifically. Okay, first we'll talk about antibiotic resistance. So antibiotics are chemicals that are produced by living organisms which inhibit or kill bacteria, but do not normally harm human tissue. Uh, most antibiotics are produced by fungi. Uh, the first antibiotic to be discovered was penicillin, which was first used during the Second World War to treat a range of diseases caused by bacteria. Pen penicillin stops cell wall formation in bacteria, so preventing cell reproduction. When someone takes penicillin to treat a bacterial infection, bacteria that are sensitive to that penicillin will die. In most cases, this is the entire population or most of the population of the disease-causing bacteria. However, by chance, there may be among them one or more individual bacteria with an allele that gives them resistance to penicillin, and this allele would have arisen randomly by a mutation within that bacteria. One example of such an allele occurs in some populations of, of the bacterium that gives the staph infection, where some individual bacteria produce an enzyme penic penicillinase, which inactivates the penicillin. So as bacteria have only a single loop of DNA, they have only one copy of each gene, so the mutant allele will have an immediate effect on the phenotype of any bacterium possessing it. These individuals have a tremendous selective advantage because the bacteria without this allele will be killed while those bacteria with it can survive and reproduce. And we know bacteria reproduce very rapidly in ideal conditions, and even if there was initially only one resistant bacteria in the beginning, it could produce 10,000 million descendants within 24 hours. A large population of a penicillin-resistant strain of staph infection would result from, uh, from that reproduction. Such antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria are continually appearing. By using antibiotics the way we do, we change the environmental factors which exert selection pressures on those bacteria. A constant race is on to find new antibiotics against new resistant strains of bacteria. Um, alleles for antibiotic resistance often occur on plasmids, which are quite frequently transferred from one bacterium to another, um, even between different species of bacteria. So it is even possible for resistance to a particular antibiotic to arise in one species and then be passed on to a different species. And the more we use antibiotics, the greater the selection pressure we exert on bacteria to, re to evolve resistance against them. This could be, have, you know, enormous and serious global consequences. As you can imagine, we rely heavily on bacteria um, to eradicate many bacterial infections and diseases, and it's really allowed us to have the modern lifestyle that we have now. Um, and, you know, scientists are working really hard to try to figure out different types of antibiotics that work in different ways. So industrial melanism... This refers to the evolution of dark body colors in animal species that live in habitats blackened by industrial soot, or soot. So the phenomenon has been documented in numerous species that hide from predators by blending in with their backgrounds. So Biston bellaturia is a night flying moth which spends the day resting underneath the branches of trees. And it relies on camouflage to protect it from insect eating birds that hunt through sight. So until 1849, all known specimens of this moth uh, had pale wings with dark markings, giving them like this speckled appearance, which really helped them to um, camouflage uh, with their tree. In 1849, however, a black individual was caught near Manchester. So during the rest of the 19th century, the numbers of black uh, moths increased dramatically in some areas, whereas in other parts of the country, the speckled form remained the more common form. 
the difference in the black and speckled forms of the moth is caused by a single gene. The normal dis or the normal speckled coloring is produced by a recessive allele of this gene, while the black color is produced by the dominant allele. And up until the late 1960s, the frequencies of the allele, uh, capital C, increased in areas near industrial cities. In non-industrial areas, the allele, uh, lowercase c, remained the most common allele. So, so the selection pressure causing the change of allele frequency in industrial areas was predation by birds. In areas with unpolluted air, tree branches were often covered with gray, brown, and green lichen. And on such tree branches, speckled moths are superbly camouflaged. However, lichens are sensitive to pollutants such as sulfur dioxide and do not grow on trees near or downwind of industries, releasing these pollutants into the air. Trees in these areas have a darker bark against which the dark moths were better camouflaged. So experiments, experiments have shown that pale moths have a much higher chance of survival in unpolluted areas than dark moths, while in polluted areas, the dark moths have the selective advantage. So it's important to realize that mutations to the dominant C allele have probably always been happening. The mutation was not caused by pollution, and that's always the important thing to remember with evolution is that these mutations are not caused by a need in the environment. They, they just occur randomly. Until the 19th century, um, there was that strong selection pressure against that dominant C allele, and, um, you know, it maintained, or it stayed exceedingly rare. Mutations of the C allele to uh, the um, mutations of the recessive C allele to the dominant C allele may have occurred quite frequently, but moths with this allele would almost certainly have been eaten by birds before they could reproduce. It was changes in the environment uh, environment that affected the likelihood of the allele surviving in the population. Right? They do not affect the likelihood of such an allele arising by the mutation. Okay. So an example would be sickle cell anemia. So people who are homozygous for the HBS allele have sickle cell anemia. The possession of two copies of this allele obviously puts a person at a great selective disadvantage. People who are homozygous for the sickle cell allele are less likely to survive and reproduce. Until recently, almost everyone with sickle cell anemia died before reaching reproductive age, yet the frequency of the sickle cell allele is still high in some parts of the world, and in some parts of East Africa, it's almost 50% of babies are born as carriers for this allele, and 14% are homozygous suffering from sickle cell anemia. So the interesting part is the parts of the world where sickle cell allele is most common are also the parts of the world where malaria is found. Malaria is caused by a protocyst parasite, plasmodium, which can be introduced into a person's blood when they're infected with, with infected mosquito bites. So the parasites enter the red blood cells and multiply inside them. Malaria is a major source of illness and death in many parts of the world. Uh, the distribution of people with at least one copy of the sickle cell allele and the distribution of malaria in Africa are similar. So you see here the distribution of sickle cell, distribution of malaria. In studies carried out in some African states, it's been found that people who are heterozygous for the sickle cell allele are much less likely to suffer from a serious attack of malaria than the people who are homozygous for that allele. Heterozygous people with malaria only have about one-third of the number of plasmodium in their blood, um, and so in a study of a sample of 100 children who died from malaria, all except one were homozygotes. So although within the population as a whole, 20% of the people were heterozygotes. So what this means is that there are two strong selection pressures acting on these two alleles. Selection against people who are homozygous for the sickle cell allele. Um, it's really strong because they become seriously anemic and sick and are less likely to uh, reproduce. And selection against people who are homozygous um, is also very strong because they are more likely to die from malaria. In areas where malaria is common, heterozygotes have a strong selective advantage because they do not suffer from sickle cell anemia in the same way as people who have the homozygous version do. 
and they are much less likely to suffer badly from malaria. So both alleles remain in populations where malaria is an important environmental factor. In places where, mal where malaria was never present, selection against people with the genotype have almost completely removed it from the population. So the examples of natural selection given show the effect of a non-random process of the allele frequencies of a population of organisms. So genetic drift is when chance events cause changes in frequencies of alleles in a population. Alleles are the genetic variations in a population and they are the driving force behind the evolution of that population. It is most noticeable when a small number of individuals are separated from the rest of a large population. They form only a small sample of the original population and so are unlikely to have the same allele frequencies as, that, as, as the larger population. Further genetic drift in the small population will alter the allele frequency still more and evolution of this population may take a different direction from that of the larger parent population. And this is an example of um, probably genetic drift is largely responsible for non-African uh, genetic diversity in the world because when humans evolved in Africa, um, we spread out all over Africa and were there for, for a long time before we successfully left. And the population who left was a small population. In other words, they represented a small percentage of the diversity found in humans elsewhere in Africa. So when that small population carrying a small amount of genetic diversity left Africa successfully, they populated the rest of the world with that smaller amount of diversity. Therefore, um, the, the amount of, um, uh, or the amount and types of, of genetic diversity found in all parts of the world outside of Africa are due to genetic drift. Okay, the founder effect okay, is an example of, of the founder effect. So this is the establishment of a new population by a few original founders, okay, and in an extreme case by a single fertilized female, which carry only a small fraction of the total genetic variation of the parental population. So this is similar to what I was just talking about with, with human um, populations. So the Hardy-Weinberg principle, when a particular phenotypic trait is controlled by two alleles of a single gene, a dominant and recessive form, the population will be made up of three genotypes, right? You're going to have homozygous, dominant, homozygous, recessive, and heterozygous. Hardy-Weinberg principle can be used to calculate the genetic variation of a population at equilibrium. Okay, the frequency of a genotype is its proportion to the total population. The total is the whole population, that is one, and the frequencies are given as decimals. Okay, so again, the population is the whole, it's one, and the frequencies of genes within that population are fractions of that one. Right? So we use the letter P to represent the frequency of the dominant allele capital A, in the population, and the letter Q to represent the frequency of the recessive allele, lowercase a. And since there are only two alleles of this gene, you see P plus Q equals 1. Okay, so this is equation 1 of Hardy-Weinberg um, uh, equilibrium, showing that the amounts of dominant alleles, P, plus the amounts of recessive alleles, Q, equal the population. So the chance of an offspring inheriting a dominant uh, allele from both parents would be uh, p times p equals p squared, right? The chance of an offspring inheriting a recessive allele from both parents would be q times q equals q squared. Right, that makes sense. So the chance of an offspring inheriting a dominant allele from the father and a recessive allele from the mother would be p times q equals pq. And the chance of an offspring inheriting a dominant allele from mother and a recessive from father would be p times q equals pq. Okay, so p squared plus 2pq plus q squared 
equals 1. Okay. So that's what we have in this equation 2. So for calculating genotype frequency, okay, the homozygous recessives in a population can be recognized and counted. So suppose that the incidence of a homozygous recessive genotype is 1 in 100 individuals, okay, so 1%. Then Q squared would equal 0.01, okay, and Q would be the square root of 0.01, which equals 0.1. So using our first equation, P equals 1 minus 0.1 equals 0.9, and P squared equals 0.9 squared equals 0.81. So that is 81% of the population are homozygous, capital A, capital A. Okay. Or using equation 2, 2PQ two equals 1 minus 0.1 plus 0.81 equals 0.18. So that is 18% of the population are heterozygous. So these Hardy-Weinberg calculations do not apply when the population is small or when there is either significant selective pressure against one of the genotypes, migration of individuals carrying one of the two alleles into or out of the population, or non-random mating. Okay, so farmers and breeders allowed only uh, the plants and animals with particular phenotypic traits and desirable characteristics to reproduce, causing the evolution of farm stock. Uh, this process is called artificial selection because humans are the ones that are selecting for uh, the animals that have the greatest fitness. Artificial selection puts selection pressures on organisms. And for thousands of years, people have done this with cattle. Okay, we've done it to, to try to improve cattle, and by improve, I mean improve for our use. Okay, so we desire features like docility, fast growth rates, high milk yields. Okay, and these increases in these characteristics have been achieved by selective breeding. Individuals showing one or more of these things we really desire will be bred with another um, to try to get more of those phenotypic traits in their offspring. Some of these alleles confirming these features are passed on to the individual's offspring. And again, the best animals from that generation are chosen again for breeding. So over many generations of this, alleles confirming those desired characteristics in increase their frequency, while those confirming characteristics that are not desired by the breeder will decrease in frequency. And in many cases, such disadvantages, um, disadvantaged alleles are lost entirely. Such selective breeding of dairy cattle presents the breeder with problems. The animals are large and take time to reach maturity. The gestation period is long, and the number of offspring produced is small. So a bull cannot be assessed for milk production, since this is a sex-limited trait. Instead, the performance of the bull's female offspring is looked to see whether or not the bull can be used in further crosses. This is called progeny testing and is a measure of the bull's value to a breeder. So the traits limited to only one sex due to anatomical differences are called sex-limited traits. Such trait affects a structure or function of the body of males or females only. So beard growth in humans is limited to men. A woman does not grow a beard herself, but she can pass the genes on for a heavy beard to her sons. Progeny testing is a process by which a male's parent's genetic merit is measured through the performance of his progeny. So that means bulls are evaluated on the basis of their daughter's performance. The process is referred to as progeny testing. It's important to realize that selective breeders have to consider the whole genotype of an organism, not just the genes affecting the desired trait, such as increased milk yield. Um, within each organism's genotype, are all the alleles of genes that adapt to its particular environment. And these are all called background genes. And they're only background in, you know, in this case, because we are, you know, in this particular case, we only care about milk genes. So everything else is background to us. So suppose that the chosen parents come from the same environment and are from varieties that have already undergone some artificial selection. 
it is likely that these parents share a large number of alleles of background genes. So the offspring will be adopted from that same environment. But suppose instead that one of the chosen parents comes from a different part of the world. The offspring will inherit appropriate alleles from only one parent. It may show the trait being selected for, but it may not be well adapted to its environment. So the same problem is seen um, when a cross is made between a cultivated plant and a, and a wild species. So although most species do not breed with different species, some can and produce fertile offspring. So such species are often those that do not normally come in contact with one another because they live in different areas. Uh, the wild parent will have alleles that are not wanted um, and which have probably been selected out of the cultivated parent. It was not until the 20th century that we really understood how we can affect the characteristics of crop plants by artificial selection and selective breeding. But although these early farmers knew nothing of genes and inheritance, they did realize that characteristics were passed from parents to offspring. And the farmers picked out the best of the plants that grew in one year, allowing them to breed and produce the grain for the next year. And over thousands of years of this, um, it has brought about great changes in the cultivated varieties of these crop plants compared with their wild ancestors. Like just look at the corn here. Today's selective breeding continues to be our main method by which new varieties of crop plants are produced. In some cases though, gene technology is being used to alter them. Tomatoes were bred from the size of blueberries to their modern size. Uh, maize was bred from an unfamiliar tall grass type plant. Um, larger infernal kernels were selected for over thousands of years in order to allow the crop to be a more effective food source. Most modern varieties of wheat belong to the species Triticum estivum. Selective breeding has produced many different varieties of wheat, much of it grown to produce grains and rich in gluten, which makes them good for bread flour. Um, for making other food products like pastries, varieties, and stuff, gluten, uh, less gluten is better. Not just yield, also um, disease resistance is bred for uh, by humans. So breeding for resistance to various fungal diseases, um, as well as other types of infections, um, and, and um, predators that might, uh, or pests that might eat the plants, right? Successful introduction, introduction of an allele giving resistance takes many generations, especially when it comes from a wheat grown in different parts of the world. So to help with selective breeding of wheat, the Genetic Improvement Network was set up in the UK to bring together research um, workers and commercial plant breeders. It's aimed to support the development of new varieties. Wheat plants now have much shorter stems than they did just 50 years ago. Uh, this makes them easier to harvest, which means they have higher yields because they put more, ener more energy into making seeds rather than growing tall. So the shorter stems also make the plants less susceptible to being not knocked flat by rain or wind, and they produce less straw, which has little value to us. Most of the dwarf varieties of wheat carry mutant alleles of two reduced height, genes, and these genes code for Della proteins, which reduce the effect of gibberlins on growth. The mutant alleles cause dwarfism by producing more um, or more active forms of these transcription inhibitors. There's a mutant allele of a different gene called Tom Thumb, which has its dwarfing effect because the plant cells do not have receptors for gibberlins and so cannot respond to the hormone. Della proteins play a key role in growth regulatory signaling pathways in plants. This group of, of proteins act at, really as a growth repressor. So this type of rice is also the subject of selective breeding. The yield of rice can be reduced by bacterial diseases such as bacterial blight and a range of fungal diseases. Researchers are hoping to use selective breeding to produce varieties of rice that are resistant to a lot of these. In breeding and hybridization, so maize um, is also known as corn in most parts of the world. It's a sturdy tall grass with broad strapped uh, shaped leaves. Maize grows best in climates with long hot summers, which provide plenty of time for its seeds to ripen. 
It was originally grown in Central and South America, um, but now it's a staple crop in Africa, Europe, America, Australia, New Zealand, China, and Indonesia. So if maize plants are inbred, the plants in each generation become progressively smaller and weaker. And this inbreeding depression occurs because in maize, homozygous plants are less vigorous than heterozygous ones. Okay, so this leads us to outbreeding, which is crossing with homozygous plants, I'm sorry, crossing with other less closely related plants, which will produce heterozygous ones that are healthier, grow taller, and produce higher yields. However, if outbreeding is done at random, the farmer could end up with a field full of maize in which there's too much variation between plants. That could make things difficult um, to be able to harvest and sell the crop easily. They need the plants to be uniform. They should all be about the same height, ripen at the same time, etc. So the challenge when growing maize is to achieve both heterozygosity and uniformity. Okay, farmers buy maize seed from companies that specialize in use inbreeding to produce homozygous plates and then crossing them. So this produces F1 plants that all have the same genotype. There are many different homozygous maize varieties and different crosses between them produce a large number of hybrids that are suited for these different purposes. So every year, thousands of new maize hybrids are trialed, searching for varieties with the characteristics that we like, including high yields, resistance to more pests, uh, pests and diseases, and good growth in nutrient-poor soils, um, and where maybe water is short in supply. Okay, so this leads us to the Darwin-Wallace theory of evolution by natural selection. The original theory that natural selection might be a mechanism by which evolution could occur was put forward independently by both Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace in 1856. They knew nothing of genes or mutations, so they did not understand how natural variation arised or was inherited, but they realized the significance of the variation. The observations and deductions um, of Charles Warren. So their observations were that organisms produce more offspring than are needed to replace the parents, that natural populations tend to remain stable in size over long periods, and that there is variation among those individuals of any given species. And from that, they deduce that there is competition for survival, right? So if organisms produce more offspring than are needed to replace their parents, that creates this struggle for existence and that the best adapted variants will be selected for by the natural conditions or the environment operating at that time. So in other words, natural selection will occur, and the best or most fit variants have that selective advantage, right? So then survival of the fittest occurs. So this theory put forward well over a century ago hardly differs from what we know about natural selection and evolution now. Really, the only major difference is that now we understand genes, right? So we understand natural selection is really selecting particular alleles or groups of alleles. The title of Darwin's book um, contained the words on the origins of species, yet despite his thorough consideration of how natural selection would cause evolution, he did not know how new species could be produced. We know now this process called speciation. Species and natural selection can act on variation within a population to bring about changes in allele frequencies. Um, there is now a wealth of evidence to support the idea that natural selection is the force that produced all of the different species on Earth. So how can natural selection produce a new species? Okay. First, I guess we really need to understand what a new species or what is a species. So morphological features are structural features. Physiological features are the way that the body works. Biochemical features include the sequence of bases of DNA molecules and the sequence of amino acids and proteins. So all donkeys look and work like donkeys and can breed with other donkeys to produce more donkeys, which themselves can interbreed. All donkeys belong to the same species. Donkeys can interbreed with organisms of another similar species, horses, to produce offspring that we call mules. However, mules are infertile. They cannot breed and are effectively a dead end. So thus donkeys and horses belong to a different species. So when a decision needs to be made as to whether two organisms belong to the same species or to two different species, the organisms could ideally be tested to find out if they can interbreed successfully. However, as you can imagine, that's not always possible. 
uh, perhaps the organisms are dead, uh, you know, extinct. Maybe they are in museums or fossils. Maybe they're the same sex. Uh, perhaps the biologist making the decision doesn't have the time or facilities to attempt to interbreed them. And perhaps they won't breed in captivity. Um, perhaps they're not organisms which produce sexually, but only asexually. Or perhaps they're immature and not able to breed. Okay, so biologists frequently rely only on morphological, biochemical, physiological, and behavioral differences to decide whether they are looking at specimens for one or two species. And really our sort of definition of species is pretty sloppy. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement in understanding exactly what a species is. So in practice, it can only be morphological features which are considered because physiological and biochemical ones, and to some extent behavioral, are more time consuming and sometimes not even possible to investigate. Sometimes, however, detailed studies of DNA sequences may be used to assess how similar two organisms are to each other. It really can be difficult to decide when these features are sufficiently similar or different to define them as being in different species. And this leads to great uncertainties and disagreements um, about whether to lump many slightly different variations of organisms together into one species or whether to split them up into many different species. And many scientists kind of identify, self-identify as lumpers or splitters, meaning they tend to ignore minor variations to put things in together as a same species or those who recognize minor variation as important and split them into many different species. Many biologists would agree that the feature which really decides is their, is their inability to interbreed successfully. So in explaining how natural selection can produce a new species, we have to consider how a group of interbreeding organisms can produce another group of organisms which cannot. So the two groups must undergo reproductive isolation. Reproductive isolation can take different forms. Um, there's the prezygotic, which is before the zygote is formed, isolating mechanisms that include individuals not recognizing one another as potential mates or not responding to each other's mating behaviors, animals being physically unable to mate, incompatibility of pollen and stigma, the inability of a male gamete to fuse with the female gamete. Okay, and then there's the postzygotic isolating mechanisms, which include failure of cell division in the zygote, non-viable offspring, okay, that means offspring that will die uh, young, or viable but sterile offspring. So this brings us to uh, allopatric speciation. So allopatric speciation is the most common form of speciation, uh, and that's when populations of a species become geographically isolated. Okay, so when populations become separated, gene flow between them ceases, right? So you see here in these two pictures, you have the mainland and then you have the Galapagos. You have birds that ended up here. They became geographically separated, and there's no gene flow in between these two populations. Okay, over time, the populations may become genetically different in response to their natural selection imposed in their different environments, right? So you can see this environment looks different than this environment. Therefore, that environment is going to put different uh, environmental pressures on them. So to understand what sympatric speciation is, first we have to understand polyploidy. So polyploidy is a condition in which an individual has sets of chromosomes greater than the normal diploid number. So the number of chromosomes making up one set is the haploid number, n. The number of chromosomes making up two sets is the diploid number, 2n. And polyploid species would be represented by 3n, 4n, etc. Organisms who are polyploidy are generally sterile. So as there are four of each kind of chromosome, all four try to pair up during meiosis 1, and then they get into this thing where it doesn't work, they're incompatible. Hey, it's very difficult for the cell to divide my, by meiosis and produce new cells, um, each with complete sets of chromosomes. However, the cell may well be able to grow um, and to reproduce asexually, each cell, uh, and there is nothing to stop mitosis from happening normally. So this doesn't quite happen in plants, but rarely in animals, largely because most animals do not reproduce asexually. So just occasionally, this tetraploid plant may manage to produce gametes, okay, and they will be diploid gametes. 
if one of them should fuse with a gamete with, from the normal original diploid plant, then the resulting zygote will be triploid. Okay, once again, it may be able to grow normally, but it will certainly be sterile. And there is no way in which it can produce gametes because it cannot share the three sets of chromosomes out evenly between the daughter cells. So the original diploid plant and the tetraploid that was produced cannot interbreed. They can be considered different species, and a new species has arisen in just one generation. So the term autoplady is generally used to describe the so-called generative multiplication of the chromos chromosomal set. Autoploids occur as a result of genome doubling within the same individual. While Alloploidy, polyploid individual or strain having a chromosome set composed of two or more chromosome sets, which are derived more or less complete from different species. Okay, so you can see how this is happening here. Okay, the formation of the alloploids here. So you have diploid A and diploid B. They go through these process. Okay, there's the homoploid hybrid. But then as the gametes are separating, there are these sort of like random different numbers in each. Okay. Um, and then depending on which ones are breeding together, you might end up here, but you could also end up with this and this coming together, right? So it's the individual strain having a chromosome composed of two or more chromosome sets derived more or less complete from different species. So alloploidy is when they're when the chromosome sets are from different species, and autoploidy is when chromosome sets are from the same species. Okay, so again, allopolyploidy allo occurs when two different species contribute to a polyploid hybrid. However, the hybrids can propagate asexually, so this only happens in plants, that particular thing. And then in autoploidy, um, that occurs when an individual has more than two sets of chromosomes. Okay, so they're 4n or more. Um, all derived from an original species that was 2n. Okay, so in autopolyploidy, a failure in meiosis causes the chromosomes to fail to separate, resulting in gametes with twice as many chromosomes as normal. Okay, so, chromos so instead of having just n, they have 2n in their gametes. One well-documented instance of speciation through allopolyploidy is the cord grass. So this is a vigorous grass that grows in salt marshes. Before 1830, the species Spartina that grew in these places in England was South Maritima. Then in 1829, a different species was imported from America. Okay? They hybridized, okay, they interbred, producing a new species. This is a diploid plant with one set of chromosomes and one set, uh, one set of chromosomes from Maritima and one set from Alternaflora. It is sterile because the two sets of chromosomes from its parents cannot pair up. So it cannot go undergo meiosis successfully to create gametes of its own, okay? nor can it breed with either of its two parents, making it a different species. And although it is sterile, it has been able to spread, um, reproducing asexually, right, like by cloning, by producing underground stems um, from which new plants can grow. Sometime later, a uh, faulty cell division produced cells with double the number of chromosomes. A tetraboid plant was produced, probably from the fusion of two abnormal diploid gametes. So this tetraploid has two sets of chromosomes that originally came from S. maritima and two sets from Alternaflora. Okay, this is allotetraploid. These chromosomes can pair up with each other, two and two, during meiosis. So this tetraploid plant is then fertile. It has been named S. angelica, Okay, it's more vigorous than any of the other three species and has spread so widely and successfully, it has practically replaced the rest of them in England. Molecular evidence uh, from comparisons of the amino acid sequences of proteins and the nucleotide sequences of mitochondrial DNA can be used to reveal similarities between related species. So if you're comparing amino acid sequences of proteins, changing a single amino acid in the primary structure can have a dramatic change in its structure and function. However, many proteins, small changes in the amino acid sequence leaves the structure and function of the protein unaltered. 
Typically, the part of the molecule essential for its function remains the same, but other parts might change. So when the amino acid sequence of a particular protein is compared in different species, the number of differences gives a measure of how closely related species are. So cytochrome's uh, C's example. Cytochrome is a component of the electron transfer chain and oxidative phosphorylation in mitochondria. A protein with such an important function is expected to have a similar sequence of amino acids in different species, since a poorly adapted uh, cytochrome molecule would result in the death of the organism. When the sequences of cytochrome from humans, mice, and rats are compared, it's found that all three molecules consist of 104 amino acids. The sequences of mouse and rat cytochromes are identical. Nine amino acids in human cytochrome care different from the mouse or rat sequence. And most of the substitutions in the human um, of amino acids with the same type of R group. So this comparison suggests that mice and rats are closely related species, sharing a recent common ancestor, and that humans are more distantly related, sharing a common ancestor with mice and rats less recently. When the sequences of cytochrome from other species, like a fruit fly or a nematome worm, are examined, the number of differences from the human sequence increases. These organisms are less closely related. So by comparing, um, so looking at differences in the nucleotide sequences of mitochondrial DNA, it, this can be used to study the origin and spread of our own species. Human mitochondrial DNA is inherited through the female line. So a zygote contains the mitochondria of the ovum, not the sperm. Since the mitochondrial DNA is circular and cannot undergo any form of crossing over, changes in the nucleotide uh, sequence only arise by mutation. Mitochondrial DNA mutates faster than nuclear DNA, acquiring about one mutation every 25,000 years. And unlike nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA is not protected by histone proteins and oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria can produce forms of oxygen that act as mutagens. Different human populations show differences in mitochondrial DNA sequences. These provide evidence for the origin of Homo sapiens in Africa and for the subsequent migrations of the species around the world. These studies have led to the suggestion that all modern humans, of whatever race, are descendants from one woman called Mitochondrial Eve who lived in Africa between 150 and 200,000 years ago. So this date is derived from the molecular clock hypothesis. It's a model which assumes a constant rate of mutation over time and that the greater the number of differences in the sequence of nucleotides, the longer ago those individuals shared a common ancestor. The clock can be calibrated by comparing nucleotide sequences of species whose date of speciation can be estimated from fossil evidence. Analysis of mitochondrial DNA of different species of lizards that are found throughout the Caribbean and the adjacent mainland provides evidence of their relationships. Each island species of lizard is found only on one island or one small group of island. These results show that the three species are more closely related than a Proctorus than they are to each other. This suggests that these species have each originated from separate events in which a few individuals from Aparcatus spread from Cuba to three different places. The mitochondrial DNA analysis shows that allopatric speciation has occurred. So I really um, encourage you to pause and look at a lot of these tables as well as in your book, because this is a really easy question that you might get where they're having you look at these differences um, throughout the mitochondrial DNA um, mutations in, in these species, and then ask you to come to a conclusion about what happened. Okay, so species may become extinct, perhaps as a result of a change in the climate or increased competition. The International Union for Conservation of Nature publishes a red list of threatened species every year. Um, the 2013 list contained 21,286 species. The species in the red list are all under threat of extinction. Of course, millions of species have become extinct in the past, sometimes huge numbers at one time in so-called mass extinction events. However, these events are natural, and at least some are thought to have been caused by changes in the environment, like an asteroid colliding with Earth. We are currently facing the likelihood of another mass extinction, this time caused by us. The main reason for this is loss of habitat. Many species are adapted for survival in a particular habitat with a particular range of environmental conditions. 
we are destroying those habitats by draining wetlands, cutting down forests, polluting. Um, and another reason for a species to become extinct is if we kill too many of them, uh, perhaps for sport or for food. Some endangered species have a very high profile, like pandas, rhinos, tigers. You'll be able to find a great deal of information about them on the internet, but some, like this carry slug, um, are not surprisingly, have a, has a very high proportion of vertebrates as opposed to invertebrates, and green plants as opposed to proto, um, protocysts. There are no prokaryotes in the list. We have absolutely no idea how many of those are threatened. So despite the high profile of some mammalian species, extinctions continue. Estimates in 2011 suggest that the global population of all tiger species is about 5,000. In India, which is expected soon to overtake China as the nation with the largest human population, um, the pressure is on to, of the remaining tiger populations. In China, where tiger products are thought to cure a variety of disease, poaching is still common and highly organized. In 2011, the western black rhino of Africa was declared extinct. Okay. Um, it's thought that the last uh, uh, rhino from Java, the Javan rhino, in Vietnam was killed by poachers in 2010, leaving only the small and declining population on Java. Only the African southern white rhino, which numbered only 100 individuals at the beginning of the 20th century, is recovering. These rhino extinctions, despite years of conservation efforts, are the result of a lack of political support, increasing demand for rhino horn from, from China for its uh, supposed um, medicinal qualities, internationally organized criminal groups targeting rhinos. Um, some conservationists think that it is time to stop concentrating on some of the world's higher profile species and start to look at um, our and start to turn to others where conservation efforts are likely to have a greater degree of success. This would involve focusing efforts on certain animals and plants that can be saved at the expense of those that are too difficult or too costly to preserve in the wild. Uh, conservation programs now often try to conserve whole ecosystems uh, rather than concentrating on a single species, which is probably a, a better and safer bet. Okay, that is the end for chapter 17. Thank you.